Peterson. Um, today I wanted to remind us of the ideas of Colin Rowe. I think history will show that he was the most important architectural theorist of the late 20th century. He was the only writer and teacher to formulate an integrated set of ideas that link historic and contemporary architectural phenomenon. He treated architecture as a timeless, self-referential area of formal study and inquiry, establishing along with his colleagues and students four of the most powerful and influential hypotheses for architecture during this period, and just to restate them. First was the idea of contextualism, which is frequently misrepresented as simply mimicry. However, contextualism is really a sophisticated proposition about formal deformation and simultaneous architectural expression. It demonstrates how architecture can form a dialectic that accommodates both general types and specific conditions. Architecture can be both autonomous object and dependent urban structure, texture. Second was phenomenal transparency, a concept which could explain the effects of layered frontalized space in both modern architecture and Cuba's painting. Phenomenal transparency also demonstrated how shallow space was developed in both historic and modern facades to elicit complex multivalent patterns. Third was figure ground, the idea of a dense, contrasting, spatial formal field. This was converted by Colin and others to, from the architectural, to architectural use from Gestalt psychology. Analogous to an electromagnetic field, the spatial formal field of urban design and architecture can be manipulated as an independent medium of composition. And this is some discovery. Figure ground field theory has extensive implications, not only as an analytical tool, but also as a precondition for the design of urban texture, as well as the prerequisite for the facade effects observed in phenomenal transparency. Fourth was the concept of architectural collage, a transposition into architecture and urbanism of the unique cubist method of composition involving the conjunction of fragmented forms and partial references. Architectural collage was an ironic rapprochement between modernism and its rejection of history. It used a quintessentially modern aesthetic technique to give unprecedented access through design to all historic forms and even utopian images. The catalyst for much of this thinking was Collins' urban design program at Cornell University, which he developed into a new and unique field of study. Urban design began as a straightforward critique of modern urbanism, but it evolved into a separate design discipline a satellite architecture with its own set of characteristic ideas and techniques. Alone, each of these achievements would be exceptional, seen together in retrospect and viewed along with his articles, teaching, and lectures. The whole begins to coalesce, forming a consistent set of ideas with a genuine lyric coherence. In combination, it all acts as a standard model, which has changed our understanding of architecture and urbanism. But how did Colin do it? What was his method? He was often preoccupied with apparently random and esoteric subjects. He didn't seem to work at or worry about things like anyone else. In fact, he usually appeared to be in a ceaseless conversation which one imagined to be only partly audible. Conversation, in fact, was integral with his character. It even informs the style of his lectures and writing. So I looked up the word conversation, and not surprisingly, it is packed with Colin-like qualities. Listen to this. Conversation first means an exchange, a spoken exchange. Conversation is also the converse. It implies the opposite. Conversation implicitly is to be converted, persuaded, and changed to a new belief. Conversation is conversion in another sense, as in a conversion factor, which translates information from one system to another, or in Collins' case, probably one time to another. Finally, the continuous practice of conversation leads to being conversant. That is, to have a total grasp of a subject by study and experience. Evidently, Collins' pursuit of conversation was more than a diversion. We know that it served as a primary source of his own amusement, but it probably also was the chief mechanism for his extraordinary intellectual achievement. It was clearly the essence of his charisma.